prepared? I will present what I prepared, and what I prepared is, uh, it's a bit general introduction to the relation between Leibniz and Whitehead. Uh, so I guess that the Whitehead stuff won't be new to anyone, but, uh, but uh, we can, uh, during the discussion, we can uh, be more specific if you have uh, specific questions. Um, so I will be talking about Leibniz's and Whitehead's metaphysics of motion and the idea of a state of change, and I will be talking also a bit about Russell, uh, Bertrand Russell. Um, but the aim of my talk uh, is to emphasize not so much to, to, to talk about specifically about Whitehead, but to emphasize the relation between Leibniz's and Whitehead's uh, perspectives on activity and motion. In particular, I would like to emphasize the importance that Leibniz and Whitehead attribute to the idea of a state of change. This is an idea that is crucial for both, th both thinkers and one that they both struggle to incorporate in their analysis of nature. So prior to the discussion on Leibniz and Whitehead, I would like to provide a broad historical perspective on the central problem that Leibniz and Whitehead try to deal with in their metaphysical analysis of activity and motion. And the problem I have in mind is, of course, that of change, the problem of change, which is the crucial problem for any process philosopher. Um, is change real or is it only an illusion, an appearance? This long-standing debate over the ontological status of change goes back to antiquity and can be framed in terms of the contrast between Heraclitus and Parmenides. It is Parmenides who is thought of as the originator of the static perspective on reality since he rules out the possibility of change and declares that since change leads to the impossible conclusion that something can come from what is not, it doesn't exist. However, Parmenides' overall rejection of change is not so much the starting point of my talk as are the explanation of the ancient atomists that followed it. The atomists respond to Parmenides' overall rejection of change by transforming it into a reductionist form of explanation. According to the atomist, there is such thing as change, but it exists only as a relational different. So for change to exist, it is sufficient that the same particle change the arrangement relative to one another. There is nothing beyond the rearrangement of particles. Notice that the idea that change can only be real if a state of change is real was tacitly assumed by those who argued for the unreality of change. So for example, Zenos uses the idea of state of change, our intuitions that there is a state of change in order to refute motion. So let us take, for example, Zeno's paradox of the flying arrow, which rests on the assumption that when something changes, it must involve some internal state of change. But since the arrow is actually at rest at any moment of its flight, that is, since there is no such, since there is no such internal state that is considered essential to change, the motion of the arrow is impossible. While Zeno's overall rejection of change incorporates the intuitive appeal to the idea of a state of change, the reductionist form of explanation suggests that we should simply degrade change, such, such that change becomes merely a relational difference. So rather than denying change altogether, we should just eliminate the idea of a state of change while arguing, arguing that change exists, although a state of change or a state of transition does not. It was Bertrand Russell who struggled, who suggested one of the most famous forms of reduction in 1903 in his Principles of Mathematics. Russell, cla Russell claimed that change in the metaphysical sense I do not at all admit, and there is no such thing as a state of change. Russell's conception of change is known in the literature as Cambridge change, according to which change is merely a relational difference. Russell's definition is as follows. Russell's defini definition of change. He writes, change is the difference in respect of truth or falsehood between a proposition concerning an entity in time t and a proposition concerning the same entity in another time t tag, provided that the two propositions differ only by the fact that t occurs in the one where t tag occurs in the other. So, for example, just to give an example of this, what's ha happening with this definition. If I 
states on two different occasions that it is now morning, my statement would bear different truth value at the different times. That is, it would be true when stated during the morning and false when stated during afternoon, evening, or night. So I would like to clarify the meaning, the metaphysical meaning of Russell's definition of, of change by contrasting it with a point made by Aristotle in his categories. Recall that Aristotle defines a substance as that which can remain numerically the same while receiving contraries. In other words, a substance is that which has the ability to persist through change, and it is defined in terms of this ability. After presenting this distinctive feature of the substance as that which can persist through change, Aristotle raises a possible objection to it. According to his objection, there are other things that may persist through change and remain numerically the same. Aristotle refers here to statements and beliefs, such, for example, the statement, it is now morning, which is numerically the same and receive different truth values. So have we here a case in which, we have here a case in which the same statement receive contraries, but does this mean that statements and beliefs are substances? Obviously not. At this point, Aristotle struggles to express the exact nature of the change that he has in mind. He writes, however, even if we to grant this, that statements and beliefs can also receive contraries, there is still a difference in the way contraries are received. For in the case of substances, it is by themselves changing that they are able to receive contraries. For what has become cold instead of hot, or dark instead of pale, or good instead of bad, has changed. Similarly, in other cases, too, it is by itself undergoing change that each thing is able to receive contraries. Statements and beliefs, on the other hand, themselves remain completely unchangeable in every way. It is because the actual thing changes that the contrary comes to belong to them. So the conflict between the Aristotelian and the Russellian definitions of change is clear. According to Russell, every change is only relational, while change in the Aristotelian sense does not exist. According to Aristotle, on the other hand, there is change in the intrinsic properties of a thing. In fact, not only there is change in the intri intrinsic properties, but change itself is an intrinsic property. While the reductionist hold that all there is to the process of change is that thing has one property at one time and another property at another, a non-reductionist explanation concentrates on the idea of a state of change as a key to understanding the nature of change in general. In his book, God and the Soul, published in 1969, Peter Geach asserted that there is still a certain feeling that Cambridge changes, that is, Russell types of, the Russell's type of change is not real change, and that a formulation of the Cambridge criterion for change is intuitively unsatisfactory since, since it does not help to distinguish real change, for example, Socrates' death, from changes in relational properties, for example, Xantippe becoming a widow. Gitch does not suggest a definition of real change, admitting that I, don't, I, I do not know of any criterion, let alone a sharp one, that will tell us when we have real changes. Yet he does note that clarifying the meaning of the positive aspects of real change is the urgent task of philosophy, which is still the urgent task of philosophy. Um, okay, so to consider a state of change a simple category in metaphysics means that it is fundamental to and more basic than a mere change of states. My working hypothesis is that a detailed examination of the ways in which the non-reductionist alternative may manifest itself, as in the case of Leibniz's and Whited system, is insightful in attempt attempting to conceptualize the idea of real change. And I suggest that, to, that we focus on the phenomenon of motion as a case study in order to clarify the idea of a state of change. I therefore turn now to consider the analysis of motion as transition or a state of change. So on the face of it, the attempt to explicate the idea of state of change through the metaphysical analysis of motion is intuitively appealing. After all, motion is the example par excellence of change. As E.J. Lowe wrote, 
Motion presents a crucial challenge for the thesis that change is not illusory, for no change seems more real than movement. And if movement can be shown for any reason to be impossible, then it, then it will be difficult to resist the perplexing conclusion that change in general is impossible. And Graham Price also discusses the problem of change by focusing on motion, and he writes, not because there is something peculiar about motion, quite the reverse, it is the paradigm of change. Fixing on it will allow the discussion a precision it would otherwise lack. And what I say concerning motion can easily be generalized to other kinds of change. It is thus surprising that addressing the idea of a state of change by focusing on the phenomenon of motion is not a common strate strategy. In the contemporary literature, the question at stake is whether time itself involves an essential ingredient of motion or transition. That is, the question is if time moves or, or if time is static or if time is dynamic, if time moves. And motion, in fact, enters into the debate indirectly as a metaphor that illustrates the nature of time as something as moves or flows. This account is obviously problematic since if motion is defined as a change in relation to time, it is not clear how the motion of time is to be comprehended. Another problem is simply that the analysis of motion itself is omitted and the standard definition of motion as the mere change in position with respect to time is taken for granted. I would like to dwell a bit longer on the standard definition of motion. Earlier, I discussed the general tension between real change, a state of change as I refer to it, and the mere change of states. In the case of motion, this tension is transformed into the question of whether motion, motion indicates some kind of passage or transition, or is it merely the disposition of a body, a series of successive places occupied by a mobile object. This latter definition is the standard one, the definition of motion in terms of um, occupation of different position is the standard definition. To give just one example, uh, in a paper about 10 years ago, uh, Ulrich Meyer plainly supports, he writes, Russell's and everybody else's view that motion is nothing more than a change of, uh, than a change of location uh, is true. Um, and he adds that Russell's opponent, opponents have to shoulder the burden of proof. So this view that motion is nothing more than a change in the position of a body is known as the et et theory, the et et theory of motion. And it is a special case of the Cambridge definition of change discussed above, according to which change itself is only a relational difference. According to the et et theory, motion is simply means occupying different places at different times, and being at rest simply means occupying the same place at different times. In other words, motion only indicates a different relation between occupying a place and moments in time. All we have are internally static states rather than a smooth transition. In Russell's word, there is no transition from place to place. An object in motion is simply in different places at different times. The at at theory of motion is certainly not intuitive, quite the opposite. Russell himself is aware of the intuitive discomfort that his own theory of motion entails. In our knowledge of the external world, published in 1914, Russell writes, but there remains a feeling which suggests that points and instants, even if they are infinitely numerous, can only give a jerky motion, a succession of immobilities, not a smooth transition with which the senses have made us familiar. Russell feels that despite this uneasiness, there is no need to affirm the reality of a state of motion or transition. He insists that it is unnecessary to explain motion on the basis of our experience of it as transition. Our experience does not reveal some metaphysical truth about the nature of motion and of transition. According to Russell, the smoothness of motion can simply be explained on the basis of the mathematical theory of continuity. So in spite, so this is why I asked Vaseline yesterday all these questions about uh, Alexander's view of continuity, because Russell said that the 
mathematical theory of continuity that is between every two points there is another. Third point is the only thing we need in order to understand the nature of motion and there is nothing else. Um, so in spite of the fact that continuity is easier to feel than to define, as Russell admits, our feeling of, of the motion need not to be taken into account in the analysis. In fact, and this is really strange, according to Russell, it is better for us to eliminate our discomfort from the at -at theory of motion by, a conscious, by, by means of a conscious effort to feel the nature of the mathematical theory of continuity. So if we, we work and we, we take the effort to feel the nature of the mathematical theory, we understand that it reflects the nature of motion and our experience of it. And he writes, uh, when a theory is, is apprehended logically, there is often a long and serious labor still required in order to feel it. It is necessary to dwell upon it, to acquire the kind of intimacy which in the case of foreign languages would enable us to, to think and dream in it. So this is what we have to do with the mathematical theory, yet the intuitive discomfort created by the ETA theory of motion plays an important role in the formation of, an alternative, uh, of alternative accounts. For example, and this, this is just a few examples, uh, recent examples, uh, Carol Cleland argues that Russell's conception does not fit well with our intuitions about change. And uh, John Carroll states that the Russellian view does not adequately characterize our common sense concept of motion at an instant. And Graham Price uh, also writes, this conception of motion jars against our intuitive notion of motion as genuine flux. So the, the intuitive discomfort created by the et -et theory of motion is also why the debate between the two parties, the static and the dynamic, is closely related to the question regarding the legitimacy of incorporating intuitions into metaphysical analysis. However, my focus is not so much on the question of intuition, but I will focus on the following question. Is it possible to provide a non-reductionist account of motion? one that avoids an explanation in terms of a mere disposition in space. In order to answer this question, we need to consider the manner in which a non-reductionist account of motion may manifest itself. The idea that motion is an example of a genuine process of transition and change has a long history. With its roots in Aristotle, it's been defended in the modern era by Leibniz and later by James Bergson and Alfred North Whitehead, of course. I will focus on Leibniz's and Whitehead's analysis of motion as exemplifying a primordial activity or a state of change. A comparison of Leibniz's and Whitehead's system that exposes points of similarity and difference can reveal the nature of a dynamic perspective on motion and its main presuppositions. It will show that there is no exclusive version of a dynamic description of motion and that it can be constructed and formulated in different manners. At the same time, it will reveal the common features that, that, that are essential to every formulation of a dynamic description of motion. The goal of the reminder of my talk will be to extract, through the comparison between Leibniz and Whitehead, those common features of a non-reductionist perspective on motion, and especially those features that render motion an example par excellence of a case of a, of a state of change. In order to comprehend Leibniz's and Whitehead's similar understanding of the idea of activity and motion, the role that metaphysics play, it plays in a scientific investigation must be considered. Both Leibniz and Whitehead consider the idea of metaphysics to be hypothesis subject to change. Metaphysics is a framework of general ideas that can be tested and corrected. And also, Alexander, I was surprised to hear that the, this, this um, very similar definition of metaphysics is pragmatic uh, and empirical. Uh, thus, it is also a system that evolves gradu gradually in relation to natural science, reflect reflecting its current state at a relevant per particular point in time. For both Leibniz and White, metaphysics is important not only as an external perspective on scientific discoveries after they, am, they are made, but also because it guides and has a part to play in scientific investigation itself. In other words, every inquiry 
be begins with metaphysical principles, and these pervade and, di and direct the investigation of the phenomenon. Or in Whitehead's word, in Adventures of a Theory Dictates Methods, a more definite formulation of Leibniz's and Whitehead's position further suggests that metaphysics and science are simply two different perspectives on reality. Contrary to the conventional thinking, they are indistinct and even indistinguishable. Metaphysics focuses, ge focuses on general principle and science on their applica applications. The distinction between metaphysics and science cannot be maintained as an actual fact, and this renders science as metaphysics, and metaphysics as more pragmatic than it usually comprehended. Thus, a complete account of reality must be given against the background of the underlying metaphysical level. A metaphysical framework is not only relevant, but absolutely essential to scientific inquiry. Leibniz and Whitehead share the opinion that during the course of scientific inquiry, we employ metaphysical prepositions whether we are aware of them or not, and each of them go on, goes on to declare his own presupposition explicitly and explain how they direct scientific inquiry. Furthermore, and this is the more important, Leibniz's and Whitehead's common view concerning the role of metaphysics involves a similar philosophical motivation, that, of course, the motivation to incorporate the idea of action. They both tend to construct an organic mechanism ra rather than mechanistic materialism. In the case of an organic mechanism, the insertion of internal and spontaneous action within the realm of mechanistic explanation is implied. In 1690, Leibniz remarked on his, early, on his earlier writings, uh, Leibniz writes, there was a time when I believed that all phenomena of motion could be explained only on, on purely geometrical principles, assuming no metaphysical pro, uh, propositions, and that the law of impact depends only on the composition of motion. But through a more profound meditation, I discovered that this is impossible, and I learned the truth higher than all mechanics. When writing this line, Leibniz had already changed his mind and he now believed that motion involves something more than relative disposition. He explained this something more in terms of internal principle of change, of change within the body. In 1704, he wrote, we must recognize an internal principle of change, and unless we do, there will be no natural principle of change at all, and therefore no natural change. He also wrote as follow to the boss, it is true that all natural phenomena of body can be explained through size, shape, and motion, but motion themselves, which are the cause of shapes, cannot be explained except by invoking telechias. More than two centuries later, Whitehead states that we must, therefore, in the, in the ultimate fact beyond which science ceases to analyze, include the notion of a state of change. This can help to explain the remarkable similarity between Leibniz's and Whitehead's view concern, concerning the building, building blocks of nature. For Leibniz, these are the monads that are the true atoms of nature. For Whitehead, actual entities are the final real things of which the world is made up. According to Whitehead's ontological principle, no actual entity, then there is no reason. And Leibniz writes to De Volder, that there can be nothing real in nature but simple substances and the aggregates that result from them. The similarity is striking in many ways. Monads and actual entities are similar centers of action and energy. Both are atomic units, that, that is, they cannot be divided, yet qualitatively complex, and both are ontologically prior to the material particle that is only an aggregate and not a genuine unity. A ontologically ultimate atomic, atom, as ontologically ultimate atomic elements that are active and internally complex, the actual entity and the monads challenge the traditional view of substance as a passive and empty substratum. Thus, it is not surprising that Whitehead himself argues in Science and the Modern World that it is obvious that the basing of the philosophy of the philosophy, I'm sorry, it should be, it is, it is obvious that the basing of the philosophy of organism uh, 
No, oh, no, it's okay. It's obvious that the basing of the philosophy upon the presupposition of organism must be traced back to Leibniz. It is worthwhile at this point to summarize the common aspect of Leibniz's and Whitehead's points of departure. First, science and metaphysics are interwoven. Scientific developments can influence our metaphysical system and, make, and metaphysical assumption can direct scientific investigation. Second, action is fundamental to being. This leads to a similar understanding of the building blocks of nature, Leibniz's monads and whited actual entities. And four, phenomenal motion exemplify this necessary action of primary being. An additional and final similarity that I would like to discuss is related to the fact that both Leibniz and White try to defend the reality of motion in a relational framework. Both Leibniz and White postulated a relational picture of space and time. Leibniz claimed the space is the order of coexisting things, whereas, ta whereas time is the order of successive things. You have a bit, uh, slight formulation of this idea. For Whitehead, the spatiotemporal continuum expresses the solidarity of all possible standpoints and is not effect prior to the world. It is the first determination of order. Therefore, both Leibniz and Whitehead characterize motion as also being relative. But the relativ re relativity of motion is implication in the context of, in of its ontological status, since if motion is only, rel is only relative, in what sense it is real? While according to the absolute view of space, absolute motion exists as the motion of a body with respect to absolute position in space, in the relational view, the motion of one body is measured relative to that of another, so that if two bodies are moving at the same speed, they are considered at rest in relation to one another. But in this case, the whole existence of motion is questionable. Leibniz and White are both aware of this implication and are bothered by it. Leibniz argued that motion, in all mathematical rigor, is nothing but a change in the positions of bodies with respect to one another, and so motion is not something absolute but consists in relation. Leibniz also adds that due to its relativity, motion never truly exists. Thus, one of the important goals of both Leibniz and Whitehead while constructing the metaphysical system is to ensure the reality of the phenomenon of motion in a relativi relativistic framework. Both attain the goal by introducing an active principle in nature. So let me now address the manner in which Leibniz saved the motion from its relativity. Based on his position that space and time are relational, Leibniz defined motion as the continuous change of, play, of place. He argues that the geometrical na nature of motion indicates that, like space, it consists only of relationship. Yet Leibniz admits the existence of real motion alongside relational motion. More precisely, in spite of his denial of the absoluteness of geometrical motion, Leibniz preserved the idea of absolute motion. He does so by rejecting that identification of motion and disposition. So there is kind of motion which is more than disposition, uh, which is more than the geometrical relational motion and which is considered as real or sometimes they call it proper motion. Uh, mo motion must be something more than the phenomenon of bodies occupying a series of different places. Does Leibniz write? There is a difference between an absolute true motion of a body and the mere relative change in its situation with respect to another body. But on what ground does Leibniz explain absolute true motion? As one would expect, this kind of motion is not based on the absoluteness of space of time, which are both relative for Leibniz, as we saw, but on force, or more precisely, on the active force that gives rise to it, to true motion. It is thus the idea of force that gives Leibniz a way of grounding the reality of motion. Thus, absolute motion is defined on the basis of its cause, which is internal to the moving body. Leibniz states frequently and clearly that it is force that can somehow break the relativity of motion, as for example in the following paragraph. To be able to say that an object is moving, we will acquire, therefore, not only that it changes its position with respect to 
other things, but also that the body contain in itself the cause of change, a force and action. Thus it is force within the body that underpins Le Leibniz's distinction between an absolute true motion of the body and a mere relative change of its situation re with respect to another body. Notice that Leibniz's specific usage of the term absolute is irrelevant to the dispute over the ontological status of space. Leibniz admits that space is relational, but he also feels that the relativity of, of space does not exclude the absoluteness of motion. Motion is absolute in another sense, that is, in the sense of being internal to the body. And the two ideas, the relativity of space and the absoluteness of motion, are interwoven within his metaphysical framework. This definition of absolute motion is underpinned by an internal principle is prior to its definition as a relative disposition. It is through his dynamics that Leibniz introduces the idea of force that renders motion as something real. Although at the mechanical level of explanation, motion itself comes only from motion, at another level of explanation, that is the dynamic level, the force is revealed to be the intrinsic source of action and the reason for the motion of bodies. Leibniz's force, Leibniz's force is also thought of as the activity essential to substance or as the intrinsically active agent or as the principle of vitalistic activity. Again, this intrinsic operational for of force functions as the cause of the motion of bodies and overcomes the relativity of motion. Similarly, if we set forth force aside, then nothing real remains in motion itself, since from change of place alone, one cannot determine where the true motion or the cause of the change really is. In this course of met metaphysics, Leibniz claimed that the force or the immediate cause behind those changes is something which is more real and there is enough of a basis to attribute it to one body rather than another. And it is moreover only by this that we can know which, to which one the motion better belongs. Leibniz considered force, which turns motion into more than a mere disposition as metaphysical in nature. He writes, the consideration of mere extended mass is insufficient and that use must also be made of the concept of force, which is perfectly intelligible, though it belongs to the sphere of metaphysics. So the next question is, in what sense can force be metaphysical? Naturally, it cannot mean that motion itself participate in the metaphysical domain. There cannot be any motion in the metaphysical domain, which consists only of monads and do not, that do not exist in space and cannot move. However, although the metaphysical domain does not involve motion, there is nevertheless an intimate relationship between the realm of monads and the phenomenon of, mo of motion. In particular, it is the action of the monads that explains motion. I mean, phenomenal motion, physical motion, is based on the action of monads. Motion becomes the expression of monadic action in the phenomenal domain. Phenomenal change, that is, motion is not activity itself, but only derivative, resultant of the ultimate activity of the monads. In order to understand the metaphysical nature of force, we need to consider the classification, Leibniz's classification of, fort, of force. He suggested it in his dynamics. So in his classification of forces, there are different kind of force, but uh, what is important for us is the distinction between primitive and derivative force. While primitive force are metaphysical in nature, derivative force are their modification. Through the idea of modification, derivative force, that is force which are involved in the in motion of bodies, bring with them metaphysical implications. In other words, the metaphysical force is trans transformed into derivative one thus enabling motion. However, it is not clear how Leibniz understands the nature of the modification itself. He only insists that derivative active forces must be a modification of some, something substantial or permanent that must itself be active. Thus, phenomenal motion in the final analysis, the resultant of primitive forces or the action of monads, Despite their qualitative simplicity, monads are qualitatively, qualitatively complex. Uh, 
and this complexity enables activity. Each monad is characterized by an intrinsic principle of change which is responsible for a transition from one perception to another. Monadic action itself is defined as the continuous transition from one state to another. Since there is no causal, causal influence between monads, and as you can guess, it will be very important for the comparison with Whited, uh, because here there is no influence between mon monads, so the term transition is applied only to the action of a single monad, which is, true, which is ruled by its, its internal law. This type of action is necessary in order to explain motion. So we have seen that metaphysical rather than physical consideration are what led Leibniz to explain the phenomenon of motion. They are also helpful in explaining why a moving body is to be distinguished from a resting one, which is important implication, okay? Due to the existence of force, you can, you can um, understand which one of the bodies is moving. And this is an important uh, application because according to the et et theory of motion, it is impossible to distinguish instantaneous motion from in instantaneous rest. Uh, for example, Wesley Salomon explained this as follows. He writes, there is no distinction at the, according to the et et theory of motion. Um, there is no distinction between being at rest at a point and being in motion at a point. The distinction between rest and motion arises only when we consider the position of, of the body at number of different moments. This means that aside from being at the appropriate places at appropriate times, there is no additional process of moving from one to the other. This is according to the Etta theory, of course. However, for Leibniz, it is impossible for a body to be completely at rest due to the presence of force within it. Force is inherent in all corporeal substance as such, since it is contrary to the nature of thing that there should be any body which is wholly at rest. So actually, even bodies at rest are at motion. Um, in fact, based on his account of inertia, Leibniz does not think that bodies have a tendency toward rest at all. Rather, he maintains that motion is prior to rest and that rest may be considered as inf infinitely small movement. Leibniz's concept of inertia suggests that there is something real at any given moment that distinguishes a moving body from a resting one. We can think of this as dynamical inertia. The fact that true absolute motion exists means that it must also be true at each and every moment. It is worthwhile at this point to summarize Leibniz's accounts of action and motion in the following points. Okay. So according to Leibniz, motion is always, always relative. Uh, there is nevertheless real or absolute motion that exists alongside relative motion, and absolute motion results from the force within a moving body. Um, due to the presence of force, bodies are never at rest. Rest is only infinitely small motion. There are different kinds of forces, for example, primitive and derivative. Derivative forces result from the modification of prim primary ones, and primary forces are metaphysical and relate to the action of the monads. That is, it is continuous transition from one place to another. Having established the Leibnizian perspective on motion as real phenomenon, we can now move to consider Whitehead's view. My aim here, again, is to clarify the concept of state of change and its implication for the description of the phenomenon of motion. So we begin with one of Whitehead's own references to Leibniz. In Modes of Thoughts, Whitehead writes, in Western literature, there are four great thinkers whose services to civilized thought rest largely upon their achievement in philosophical assemblage. Though each of them made important contribution to the structure of philosophical system, these men are Plato, Aristotle, Leibniz, and William James. Like Leibniz, Whitehead rejected the identification of motion and disposition. That is, he rejected the idea that motion involves a relational change and nothing more. However, when doing so, Whitehead does not commit himself to the idea of absolute motion. Whitehead, who grappled with the theory of relativity throughout his career, acknowledges that all motion is relative and there is simply no such thing as absolute motion. 
For this reason, Whitehead devotes himself to the important task of elucidating the ontological status of motion and ensuring its reality within a relational framework. In his early concept of nature, he asks, what do we mean by motion? And he states, I assume it is an axiom that motion is a physical fact. It is something that we perceive in nature. Um, however, the claim that we all know what motion is remains insufficient since we must demand that our theory of relative space will provide nature with something to be observed. You have not settled the question by bringing forward the theory according to which there is nothing to be observed and then by reiterating that nevertheless we do observe this non-existent fact. Hence, the next question is how Whitehead establishes the existence of motion as a real fact. Whitehead's point of departure in answering this question is that our experience of the world should be taken as an important factor in the analysis of nature. Since experience is itself a datum that needs to be invest investigated, since we gain our understanding of nature through the arrangement and analysis of the element of experience, so this is the basis for Whitehead's statement already quite quoted el earlier, that we must therefore in the ultimate fact beyond which science ceases to analyze include the notion of a state of change. In making this statement, Whitehead is insisting that this, ch this idea of a state of change which pervade our everyday experience be included in the analysis of nature. Whitehead's criticism of the bifurcation of nature further cl clarifies his intention. In his own words in concept of nature, what I am protesting, what I'm essentially protesting against is the bifurcation of nature into two systems of reality, which in so far as they are real, are real in different senses. Whitehead accuses modern science of making this distinction. It neglects elements that are derived from experience and with them our common sense intuitions. As he writes in Mode of Thought, modern science has gradually discarded every single feature of the original common sense in mo notion. The obvious common sense notion has been entirely destroyed. By incorporating the idea of a state of change, White had hoped to repair this situation. The fact that it includes elements from experience in the analysis of nature is related in particular to his criticism of Newtonian cosmology. According to him, the Newtonian cosmology is based on the assumption that nature, of nature, as composed of permanent things, namely bits of matter moving about in space, which otherwise is empty, a bit of matter is thus conceived as a passive fact, an individual reality, which is the same at an instant. Here we can see White's greatest discomfort with the orthodox Newtonian structure, its dismissal of temporal extension. That is, the attempt to build concept of nature on the basis of a single dimensionless moment. Whitehead holds that this account of nature at an instant is something abstracted from actual fact. It is nothing but a conception that is useful in expressing certain relations and such certain relation and as such pervades the human mind. He writes, the ultimate fact in the ultimate fact embracing all nature is a distribution of material, it's according to the traditional point of view, of course, a distribution of material throughout all space, a durational, in, durational instant of time, and another such ultimate fact in another distribution of the same material throughout the same space at another durational instance of time. Some modification is evidently necessary. This brings us to the first important difference between Leib Whitehead's and Leibniz's account of motion as a state of change. While Leibniz assumes that there is motion at an instant and that bodies are actually never at rest, Whitehead's, Whitehead, Whitehead's point of departure is that the primordial elements in nature cannot be constituted or analyzed and instantaneous since the whole idea of nature at an instant is an abstraction. Instant and point are only derivative conception, not something ultimate. The ultimate datum is, must contain the temporal stretch. Like a note of music, it requires its whole period in which to manifest itself. Except, so this is the, was the first difference between uh, Leibniz and Whitehead. Uh, the idea of motion at an instant. And the second difference between Leibniz and Whitehead uh, 
involve, and some of you discussed this point, um, the second difference involves the contrast between Leibniz's monad, which can change, and Whitehead's actual entity, which cannot. As I explained earlier, Leibniz's monad is subject to the transition from one perception to another. This transition is ultimately what makes phenomenal motion something real. On the other hand, Whitehead's <coughs> actual entities come into being and perish, but never change. In fact, Whitehead himself states in Process and Reality that his own theory is different from Leibniz's in that his monad change. According to Whitehead, it is impossible to attribute change to any actual entity, <coughs> since every entity is simply what it is. It becomes as a whole set of relation to other entities, and thus it cannot change or move. This is the core of Whitehead's doc doctrine of internal relation, and the reason <coughs> why there is no causal influence uh, among contemporary entities, it is also the, the reason why an, one entity cannot be identical to another, which uh, Regina talked about from another, another perspective. However, there is still a sense in which we can acknowledge change even within Whitehead actual entities. This is, of course, the, su the subjective aim that controls the becoming of a subject. Um, and the, it can be suggested that this Whiteheadian feature corresponds to the internal change that the monads undergo. In other words, even though Whitehead entity become and perish, they still engage a kind of internal activity or internal process comparable to Leibniz's appetition. Appetition and subjective aim are both, both teleological notions that indicate the self-development of the entity. Nonetheless, the resemblance ends here. After all, the development of the monads through appetition, and this is a quotation from Emmet, but it was, it was on your last, uh, I will just read it. It's a quotation from Emmet. Uh, she writes that the uh, unfolding of the monad simply, that the uh, appetition of the monad simply means an unfolding of its essential nature. It is simple substance, windowless, and cannot come into existence or perish by natural means. So Whitehead replaces this programmed unfolding of Leibniz by novelty, by creative advance of the universe. Till now, the similarity between Leibniz's, Leibnizian and Whiteheadian description of the substance can be summarized as follow. The substance is complex yet atomic. It is individual thing um, endowed with pow power or with active principle. And these characters are sufficient to define substance as something alive. Um, OK, so what does all this mean in the context of Whitehead's analysis of motion? And um, again, motion and rest cannot be explained on the basis of its instantaneous conception. Although Whitehead's account of motion took various forms during different phases of his career, and he explained motion in every, every single book in the concept of nature, he does this by the idea of conatus and in uh, in uh, Science in the Modern World, he uses the idea of uh, organic deformation, and in Process and Reality, he has this, uh, another uh, analysis in terms of a relation between uh, an event and duration. Uh, so he gives, he changes his, his account of motion developed. But what is common to all of them is, of course, that motion and, and rest are thought of in the co context of a special relation between extensive events. Um, this is why Whitehead's account of motion relates to the analysis of extensive relations he continued to develop throughout his career. However, and this is my last point before uh, concluding, um, the analysis in terms of extension is not enough. Um, and it is important to recognize that there, uh, Whitehead himself comment on, on his early writing that, that he made this mistake by focusing too much on extension and not as much as he should on the dynamic ca character of the entities. Um, so it is important to recognize that the, what, there is more than the analysis in terms of extensive relation. And interconnectedness, even interconnectedness, is not enough. So we must also add the idea of causation and physical transmission. Eventually, all these aspects that Whitehead suggested uh, 
in order to balance and complete his atomism, like the becoming on con continuity and the idea of real connectivity or social order, all these aspects that are balancing atomism are attached to his conception of causation and physical transmission. Uh, so you have here the sum summary of White's view, but I think I'll just skip and I'll conclude. So, okay. So transition is defined in the dictionary, in Oxford Dic English Dictionary Online, as the passing or passage from one condition, action, or rarely place to another, change. The concept of transition is intuitively associated with the idea of a state of change, the intrinsic dynamic nature of thing that is essential to the existence of change in general. This connection is made not only by Leibniz and Whitehead, but also by Russell. However, Russell, who denies an internal state of change, asserts that motion does not imply any kind of transition from one place to another. In contrast, Leibniz and Whitehead share the assumption that, and here I use Whitehead's wording in modes of thought, there is no nature apart from transition. Leibniz and Whitehead, whose analysis of motion stemmed from the idea of a state of change, agree that this idea is fundamental to the concept of relational difference. Both believe it is not only that change is real if it involves intrinsic properties, but also that the state of change itself is an intrinsic property. Thus, the idea of transition is at the heart of Leibniz's and Whitehead's metaphysical analysis of motion. The two systems can be viewed as two blueprints of similar metaphysical Aristotelian intuition that emerged during two breakthrough eras, that is, the 17th century and the beginning of the 20th century. By relating metaphysics to the scientific inquiries, both thinkers showed motion to be a phenomenon that invites an additional metaphysical analysis. Rather than analyzing the physical laws that explain motions of body, Leibniz and White had simply concentrate on the question, what is motion, in an attempt to clarify its ontological status. The phenomenon of motion is closely related to many other fundamental issues that preoccupied those two think thinkers, such as the experience of continuity, its mathematical analysis, the nature of space of time, time temporal becoming, and part-whole relations. Yet for both, motion is of special importance, mainly since, the pre, pre since it is the preeminent example of action. And its analysis is crucial for the overall system suggested by each of them. Both Leibniz and White had considered motion to be relational change ascribed to aggregates of entities. And for both of them, the analysis of motion is incomplete. This analysis in terms of relative change of position is incomplete. Eventually, motion became the exemplar in the physical domain of an essential metaphysical principle of action. This idea is related to the Aristotelian intuitions shared by both according to which a change of place exhibits qualitative rather than merely qu quantitative aspects. Indeed, the term motion signifies a change of position relative to a reference point. Yet this change of position is only one aspect of a more primitive occurrence. Motion is thus, thus explained on the basis of this kind of elemental action that characterizes the fundamental level of existence. More, moreover, Whited and Leibniz both face the challenge of explaining the reality of motion in, in a relational framework of space and time. In such a framework, the concept of transition has tremendous metaphysical significance, since it rescues motion from its unreality. Interestingly, for both Leibniz and White, the motion is the most fundamental component from which time itself is derived. And not only time, but uh, it reminds me of your question, I think, yesterday, but also matter. So, so motion is prior to matter, space, and time. Um, and their claim that there is a dynamic aspect which constitutes time itself allows us to move away from the question of whether time itself is moving. Alongside the striking similarity between the two thinkers, there are some crucial differences. In particular, while Leibniz understood the idea of activity as something that manifests itself as instantaneous internal tendency in all being, White had understand activity in terms of non-instantaneous events. 
this goes a long way in explaining their different impacts on contemporary thought. So, for example, the whole debate, there is a, a whole contemporary debate on the question of whether there can be a instantaneous velocity is uh, related to Leibniz's, Leibniz's philosophy and other um, debates uh, such, for example, over temporal parts or immanent causation are related to Whitehead's uh, idea. Um, this wide range of topics also shows the depth of their metaphysical analysis of motion and its numerous implication. Although in the philosophical literature an explicit defense of the idea of a state of change is still uncommon, both Leibniz and Whitehead's work remind us that the reductionist perspective on motion is not predominant and that in principle the attempts to explain real change as an illusion are no more, just, no more justified than the attempt to show that our intuitions are not misleading. Indeed, there is more than one way to formulate the idea of motion as a state of change. And in a sense, the comparison between Leibniz's and Whitehead's metaphysics of motion raises questions rather than resolving them. However, and here I wish to conclude with the, one of my favorite quotations of Whitehead. Um, he writes, philosophy begins in wonder, and at the end, when philosophical thought has done its best, the wonder remains. Thank you. <laughs>